LBC, I'm Clive Bull, and it's the Consumer Hour between now and 10. If you've got a question about your consumer rights, then uh, call us on 0345 6060 973. If it's a a dispute, perhaps, with a a retailer, an argument over a contract, uh, a problem with a product, whatever your question, uh, then call us now. Uh, Also, we invite you to tell us if you are scammed, because... We're keen to get the message across. Isn't that right, Dean? Absolutely right, Clive. In fact, Clive, last week when you were on holiday, Mm. we did quite a bit about scams. And actually, after the show, I had many, many people tweeting me, texting me, um, thanking me for for the scams we had highlighted. So it really works this hour when we talk about scams. It's the only way we get to expose the scammers out there and let people know how to avoid those scams. Well, we've got one on the line already. So let's go straight to Lucy in Braintree. Dean Dunham is with me. Uh, Hello, Lucy. Hi. Hi, tell us about your scam. Well, I it has come to my attention that I had recently been targeted uh, with a scam from a company uh, under the name of uh, erecords.co.uk. And um, I received a letter through the post um, asking me to pay for the publication of my company and that lack of payment will result in a lack of entry to the e-record co- uh, .co.uk. Now, they said on this letter that they were um, to do with uh, Companies House and uh, HMRC. Now, I had recently set up um, with my accountants a new limited company, and so, therefore, I assumed that no one else had, had known their name for my company, which they had got hold of, um, and uh, they were charging me £190 for um, checking the records for the name mm. of my company. Um, so what they were implying that you had to do this, were they? Yes, uh, yes. So um, obviously in the small print they said when it was dated that they had checked for um, my uh, company's name uh, and that it was, a, it was a legal fee that needed to be settled. Um, and I, I recently went online to, after I paid it, and I, it went through PayPal as well, um, to see, um, you know, if this was actually uh, legitimate. And I, at the time, I obviously fell for it and paid it. Um, but there's uh, are lots of people online talking about that um, this is a scam. It's nothing to do with Companies House, and you do not need to pay mm. it. No. Yeah, what's your view on that? Have you heard well, of this, Dean? Well, I have heard of it, and you can see what's happened here, Clive. So Lucy has genuinely started a new company. Therefore, when this has come through, it sounded like it was genuine, I assume, Lucy. That, is that what's happened? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's always the way when you get a scam and you can relate to it and you think, actually, yes, that does relate to me. I have just done that. You think it's real. And Clive, let me say this, because I was aware of this call, but you may not be aware. Lucy was a finalist in the 2014 Britain's Got Talent. Is that right, Lucy? It is, yeah. And doesn't it show you that anyone can be scammed? A few weeks ago, I was talking about Gloria Honeyford being scammed. Even people in the public eye can be scammed. In fact, sometimes more than just general people. So... Lucy, thanks very much for telling us about this. Many other people would have seen this, um, and it's another Mm. scam we can now avoid. You've got to be kind of uh, careful, haven't you? I mean, probably there are some sort of technical words in there that that make it not, not illegal, but something that people are falling for. Yes, and what happens is, I mean, in this particular scam... The, it is matter of public record as to who starts a new company. You can buy that information. And armed with that, some people can be genuine and go and sell a genuine service. But others, as Lucy experienced, can go out and just be scammers. You have to be so careful. Roxanne in Brentwood on LBC. Hello, Roxanne. Hiya. Hi. What would you like to say? Hiya. Um, I've recently um, looked into getting a... It was just like a celebrity performance for my wedding. And uh-huh. um, they quoted me a figure of £1,800. I accepted, um, kept chasing for the contract, been chasing for like the last two weeks. Um, and then yesterday, they emailed us putting the price up. And I just want I mean, I've got everything in writing by email, me accepting by email. And I just wondered sort of where we stood legally. Because we haven't actually signed anything. It's all been done through email so far. So has it been actually agreed, or were you still, if you like, negotiating? No, it had been agreed. He gave me the figure of eight. I asked 
for the um, like the quote. He gave me eighteen hundred, yeah. and I emailed back saying, "I agree to this. Can I please have all the paperwork and contracts to sign the deposit? I'd like to pay the deposit over." Okay, but then you didn't get the paperwork and didn't sign it. No, no, um, he didn't. No, he didn't send it. I kept chasing. I've got right. two emails of me saying, "Can I have them? Can I have them?" And then re- and then yesterday we got the email sent. It gone up because. Um, they've recently had a price increase for this right. certain performance. I mean, one view of this would say, well, they offered an act, you said yes, therefore there's potentially a contract, but actually under English law, no contract arises until you have a third element, which is money passes hand. So right. therefore, there's not a binding contract, but there's some good news. Because okay. Clive and I do a double act, and we can do weddings, can't we, Yeah, Clive? we'll pop round, and the rates are very reasonable. And we won't change our mind on how much we're charging you. And we're probably a much better act anyway. Yeah, I'd go for that if I were you, Roxanne. Thank you very much. 0345 6060 973 is the number. Dean Dunham is here, the retail ombudsman and uh, consumer lawyer. If you've got a question, then uh, call us now. We were talking about Monarch uh, just before the news and the rumours of what might happen with Monarch. Um, From a consumer point of view, do do you think that uh, consumers, maybe if you've already got tickets for a, 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 a Monarch flight, should you be worried? Well, it really depends, Clive, how you've paid for those tickets and where you've purchased them. So if you have purchased direct from Monarch and you've paid with cash or bank transfer and Monarch do indeed go out of business, we don't know they're going to, but if they do, then you may well lose your money. There's no protection there. But of course, if you use your credit card and you spend more than £100 on your card, then you can go and do that. Well, I love that Section 75 claim under the Consumer Credit Act. You will get your money back. Or indeed, if you've booked a packaged holiday with a travel agent who's with Atoll or APTA, then you will also be protected and you'll get your money back. So it's not all doom and gloom. And let's face it, we don't know if they're going to go bust or if there's going to be an issue. Um, We just don't know that. But maybe if you're thinking of booking a holiday now and booking a flight with them, think about doing it via a travel agent or with your credit card, just until we know what's going to happen. OK, let's talk to Irene in Charlton. Hello, Irene. Oh, hello. Hi, go ahead. Oh, well, I've purchased a bespoke recliner <laughs> chair because I've um, got problems with my... I'm not a very well person... And I, um, I had it for about two weeks, and it wasn't satisfactory for my requirements. I've telephoned them up, and the chap came down, the one that sold it to me, but he said I could not have my money back, as it was now mine. And I explained to him that if it was made bespoke for me, I couldn't reach the remote, remote controls, and there was well, there was just so several things wrong with it. My feet didn't touch the floor, and well, that's not very bespoke, is it? It doesn't well, sound very bespoke. It's broken. It's a. Uh, I mean, it was very, very expensive. How much well, are we talking about, by the way? Uh, pardon? How much are we talking about? Three thousand six hundred pounds. Wow! Pound. Right, that is expensive. Let me quickly ask you this. So, this is bespoke. Did they come yes. out and measure you? Ask you what you needed? What did they do? All he did was said to me how um, how tall I was, and I told him how tall I was. Um, basically, that is all. So, all that he, you well, know, that all that he so had. what what did they say this chair was going to do? It was bespoke, but what did they say it would do for you? Well, they didn't actually say that. It, it was a recliner, hmm. and it helped you stand up. Right. Um, and, I, and I guess it actually is relevant how tall you are if it's going to help you stand up then. Well, this this is, um, you know, what I required. It's got um, a massager uh, on it, and um, but that's not satisfactory. I did tell him, the, hmm. you know, the circumstances, my what's wrong with me. And um, as I say, after using it, I tried very hard for about two weeks but it was so uncomfortable and it didn't massage down my legs, which is what I needed. Yeah. Well, look, com- say, comfort it's... with these things and with chairs is always difficult because it's a bit of a subjective view. What you find uncomfortable, someone else may find really comfortable. So that's always a difficult area. But the word bespoke should mean bespoke. So my yeah. view on this about seeing the chair or anything else is if that's what you've asked for, 
and you've not got what it really said on the team, what they promised you, then it breaches the law that we call the Consumer Rights Act. And the Consumer Rights Act basically says that goods have to be as described. So however they've described this wonderful chair to you is going to be, it has to meet that description. But also they have to be fit for purpose. So if this chair isn't fit for purpose, it doesn't help you stand up. It doesn't, the massage side of it doesn't work or work as it should then it appears to me they may well breach the act. I would go back to them and say, this is what I asked for. These are the details I gave you. The chair you've given me doesn't meet the bill. Therefore, I would like you to exchange it or refund it or just give me a response as to what you're going to do. I, mean, I would have thought if they'd asked for your height, then that would indicate that it was going to fit you, that, that your feet would reach the ground, for example. Would you not? reach the the remote controls on in a pocket and it's too far down for me to move put my hand over the arm to reach the remote controls yeah it doesn't sound very bespoke does it no all right well good luck irene i hope that helps thank you very much indeed uh dean dunham is here consumer lawyer and the retail ombudsman if you have a question about your consumer rights a problem with a retailer with a purchase whether it's a a high street shop or uh, maybe an online purchase or indeed if you want to tell us about a scam that you've spotted then call us now 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. You can also text 84850 and you can tweet at LBC. This is LBC. I'm Clive Bull, 915. And let's get the travel with Andy Lake. Thanks, Ferrari. Back in the morning at 7. Right now it's the Consumer Hour here on LBC. I'm Clive Bull. With me, Dean Dunham, uh, the retail ombudsman. If you have a question, then call us right now. Uh, let's go to Sarah in Leeds. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Clive. Hi. Go ahead. What would you like to say? Um, we hired somebody to uh, do our garden. So at the moment, it's a patio, and we're turning it into a garden, new fence. Um, he was a friend of a friend, um, and he asked for money for materials back in June. We gave him the money for the materials and then got a lot of excuses. Um, and now he's just stopped replying to us in total um, and we can't get in touch with him so (laughs) I'm starting to think he's going to run with the money and I'm wondering what rights we have really. Mm. And I guess you haven't seen the materials either? No, um, so when I emailed about that to start with I kept saying I understand if you can't do the work but either send me the materials or refund the money and he kept saying oh I've purchased them Um, they're going to get delivered as soon as we can start the work and then I asked for receipts of the purchase and the questions just kept getting avoided. I mean the answer to your question is you've got lots and lots of rights the law is completely on your side that's the good part of it the downside is is it going to be worth pursuing this individual who may be a sole trader or just a small company? And the answer mm-hmm. may be no. You may be throwing good money after bad. Um, what I would do is threaten him with contacting your local trading standards. Tell him you're going to go online and tell the world how bad he is. Um, even mm-hmm. say that you may contact the police because you could say he's stolen your money. Okay. Um, yeah, because we thought about trying to do a small claim, but we had to get the address and there was no registered address for the business and we can't find an address for him and he refuses to give us it. Mm. So, it's always the yeah. problem. And a small claims, the small claims court is relatively easy to use, relatively cheap. But the problem is you can win. And if the person hasn't got the money or is good at, good at avoiding you like he seems to be, it's a complete waste of time. And it really shows, it just doesn't help you, but it really shows that when you do hire someone, check them out online, see if anyone else has said anything bad. Don't give money up front, although I understand when someone wants to buy materials, that's quite difficult. But maybe on other circumstances, you could say, I'll buy the materials direct. I'll have them delivered to my house and then you can come and use them. But it doesn't help you, but it does help other listeners, hopefully. All right, Sarah, thank you very much. All the rights on your side, but getting the money might prove difficult. Uh, Sarah, thank you. On on a related point, 
Um, I don't know whether you can answer this uh, email without talking to Helen, but she can't ring in. But she says, uh, I employed a building firm about three months ago, and they told me they weren't that registered. They've been working in my house doing numerous tasks without a break for three months. Last week they informed me that they have now registered for VAT and that I've got to pay an extra 20%. Uh, when the work started, they weren't registered, so... Can they charge me VAT? Well, this is a really interesting question, Clive, Mm. because, of course, what happens by law is if a business goes over a certain turnover, they legally have to register for VAT. So these builders are probably doing what they're supposed to do, but they should be informing her as the consumer, as the customer, that now it's going to cost more money. And they really probably would have known that before they started this job. So she's probably got a pretty good argument to go back and say, that's just not what I agreed. I agreed a fixed fee with you, if indeed she did agree a fixed fee. And this is all going to come down to what have you and what haven't you agreed. And I'm guessing there's probably nothing in writing. And again, for other listeners, if you have anybody step foot in your house to do work, make sure there's something in writing because this is just one of many, many problems that could occur. Let's go to Christina in Mitcham. Hello, Christina. Hello, um, Clive. Um, we booked a flight through an agent online and had a telephone conversation with them. Um, and what happened is that the flight details changed and the flight number changed. So it made it impossible for the connecting flight to be made. So we had to look at the terms and conditions and we discovered that we were well within our rights to have a full refund. Um, The agent said that it takes six weeks. So we phoned up the airline directly to find out because the agent was blaming the airline to say that they were waiting on the airline to give us a refund. But the airline said no, that they would give an immediate refund. We phoned the agent again and mentioned that, you know, we've spoken to the airline. They said that they would give us an immediate refund. And the agent said, no, you have to wait six weeks. So um, I basically said, well, the tickets are not fit for purpose because we can't make the connecting flights. And the terms and conditions state that if in those circumstances that a consumer would be allowed to have a refund back. Um, so they promised me that we would get the refund back on the 19th of September, which was last week. And it's now been over seven weeks, going on eight weeks, and we're still waiting on the refund. I phoned them and they just keep putting, putting it down to, well, we'll email accounts and find out whether um, you're going to get your refund. So I don't know what to do. I don't know what wow. our next step is, to be honest. Well, first of all, I love your fit for purpose argument. It's absolutely right. Good way of phrasing it. Um, And what a shocking story. I mean, really, airlines do usually refund um, booking agents like this straight away. And I'm sure they did in this case. And what they're doing, quite simply, is they're keeping your money in their bank and earning interest on it. It's obvious what they're doing Um, to your detriment and to their benefit. I would go back to them in writing and say, if I'm not refunded, literally in the next few days, I'm going to send you an invoice for interest on these monies because I'm going to charge you interest. The Consumer Rights Act says when I get a refund, it should be within a reasonable amount of time. Seven weeks is anything but reasonable and threaten to report them to every man and their dog that you can think of. So they consider that actually they may be better just refunding you. And I would write to the airline again because this agent really is tarnishing their reputation as well. So it's worth putting some pressure on them or more pressure on them to assist you in this situation. But just come to the answer to this, that should not happen. OK, there you go, Christina. Thank you very much. Anna in Wallington. Hello, Anna. Hi. Good Hi. evening. Evening. Um, I'm phoning um, about a, um, a gym um, and a personal trainer. So I signed up with a gym in April. And at the same time, I signed up with a personal trainer. Um, and the personal trainer left. Um, to, we, had, we had two sessions, and after that, he left the gym. Um, unfortunately, I had paid him from my account to his account, separately to the gym. That's how they operate. Um, and um, they then, or he assigned another uh, personal trainer for me. 
but um, we only had a couple of sessions. He wasn't really as good as the original, um, and I've had some some health problems, so I, I wanted to have that particular personal trainer. However, um, he he never paid the uh, replacement personal trainer either, so he still has my three hundred pounds, and I don't really know whether I have any any right at all. Well, you clearly have rights because if you pay for a service, in this case, a personal yeah. trainer, then they have to provide the service. And if they haven't, then they ought to be giving you a refund. The difficulty is you're going to chase this personal trainer around. I guess he's quite a fast runner uh, and therefore it's going to be very difficult to get your money back. Now, the gym will not have any contractual liability to help you because I'm guessing their terms and conditions are going to exclude that on several pages. But you may want to go back to them and say, you facilitated this personal trainer. I only went to him because it was at your gym and therefore you've contributed to the problem. Are you going to help me or at least help me track the personal trainer down so I can get my money back? They ought to do that, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, they have like they've got the shirt says the gym's name and they are plastered all over the walls, you know, all the personal trainers. Um, but when I spoke to the gym about this, they said to me that, you know, we are not really responsible for them. They are uh, sole traders, which I think is wrong. So you, do you think that I should go back to them well, and say that, you know? I think you should go back to them. But is it wrong? Well, you clearly knew you were paying that personal trainer direct. It sounds like you knew that he wasn't part of the gym. So they probably will get away with that. But you should go back to them because on the basis that he's left you would have thought the gym had some kind of obligation to find out whether he was holding any monies for any of their gym members, such as yourself, and therefore to do something about it. I think they owe you some form of duty of care in this situation, so I would go back and push them. OK, good luck, Anna. Thank you very much. More calls coming in a moment. It's the Consumer Hour. Dean Dunham is here. And if you've got a question, 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. It's 9.30. I'm Clive Bull here on LBC. The headlines now with Charles Rowe. This is LBC with Clive Bull. It's the Consumer Hour here on LBC. I'm Clive Bull and Dean Dunham is with me, the retail ombudsman and consumer lawyer. 0345 6060 973 is the number if you've got a question. And let's go to Abbas in Walthamstow. Hello, Abbas. Hi, Clive. Hi, what's your question? Uh, I've had uh, an extension done recently and my builder has bought quite a lot of material from various suppliers, one of which was a back door for my garden. Uh, it's now gotten faulty. The locking mechanism doesn't quite work. Uh, since the project has ended of the extension, the builder and that supplier are no longer, uh, you know, in talk- talking terms. And so I'm in a bit of a pickle. He's passing me on to them, and they tell me that they can't do anything about it because they haven't fitted uh, the, the door. Uh, they finally conceded that this doesn't, quite sound right and they said if you take off the door and bring it to us we'll fix it as opposed to them having somebody come over and take a look so my builder can't touch the door because it's the internal mechanism and that's not something he deals with and the supplier is saying we didn't fit it so we can't we can't touch it either and i don't really know where where to where to go from here well that sounds crazy eh? and in fact it's not what i thought you were going to say i thought you were going to say because the builder's gone out of business the seller won't deal with you because you weren't the buyer of the door. Because they could have said that. They could have said to you they'll only deal with the with the, their customer, which was your builder. But So there's good news that they're not doing that. Um, mm-hmm. It does sound crazy um, that so, you, someone can't come and take the door off you and have a look at it. Just remind me, what's the actual problem? It's with the locking mechanism, is it? Yeah, there's a handle and uh, these doors, you have to pull the handle upwards and then turn the key to lock it secure. The handle doesn't go all the way upward uh, to the point where it needs to for me to turn the key. It's about short of that, yeah. Well, generally speaking, if something's faulty, you have to send it or take it back to the retailer. But there is a slight difference here because this is a door to your house and I assume if you take it off, there's a security issue. So you may want to go back to them and say, look, it's just not practical for me to do this. Um, But 
it's not locking properly. It's a security issue. If I take it off, it's a security issue. If I leave it on, therefore, I want you to think about what you can do about it and perhaps send someone out to have a to inspect the door. They really should do that because these, we're not talking about a pair of trainers that you can put back in the post. They did say uh, very, very last uh, conversation I had with them. They did say that they can send someone over at a cost. Um, so they, they kept changing their tune. Every the first it was no, we can't come over. Then it was, you know, bring the door to us. So then they said, well, we might come over, and there's a fee. Um, should I just go with this and, and just pay the fee, or do I have some manufacturer's warranty um, that I can fall back on here? I would suggest you do this. You go back in writing and ask them mm-hmm. to confirm that they will come out. Tell them that if the door turns out not to be faulty that you will pay the fee, but if the door is faulty, you want them to confirm that they won't charge you because they should not be charging you if the goods are faulty. That's your rights under the Consumer Rights Act. OK, Abbas, good luck with that. Jackie in Enfield. Hello, Jackie. Oh, hello. Hi, Jackie. Um, hi. Three weeks ago, I, I purchased a PC, and um, I purchased a new one because I wanted it to be faster and better than the 10 year old one I had um, well I, I put it I installed it, started using it and I, I saw that it was actually a very slow machine so I took it back I gave it a couple of weeks try took it back and he said to me the guy said to me I should have brought it back straight away and I said well without trying it I don't really know You know, I wouldn't know there was a problem so he reluctantly took it to check it out, he told me that maybe I've downloaded stuff and made it all slow um so basically what is my right if the machine is not you know if the pc is not what i wanted well let me ask you this first have you downloaded anything on that machine no so you put no software on it nothing at all but all i've done is um which i told him is um i've gone on facebook and online banking and he said well that wouldn't do it um that's all i've done um and you're saying that basically it's going slow it's not it's It's slower than it should do it's it's very slow it's as slow as my old one there was you know there was no point in buying a new one if it's going to do the same thing and sorry did you say they took this machine back and had a look at it He's, he's taken it back it's He's taken a few days. I mean, it's been nearly a week now, and he's still checking it out because he said he'll see, you know, what is... He's he's, um, He assured me that it is what he said it was going to be. And how how long ago did you purchase this? um, Just, well, it's two and a half weeks since I purchased it that I took it back, but it's coming up to three and a half weeks now. Okay. Well, let me give you some good news. Um, the law here, you've heard, probably heard me say it many times tonight, the Consumer Rights Act came out last year. One of the things this law says is that if goods are faulty, and if this machine is going slower than it should, it is faulty, with, and you find out within the first 30 days after purchase, and you're within that bracket, obviously, then yeah. you have the right to your money back, no questions asked. I would yeah. send him a letter now and say, I'm within the first 30 days, therefore, under the Consumer Rights Act, I believe it's faulty. Please give my money back. And they have to do that by law. Well, he told me that's one thing he won't do. I'm sure he did. And many people do say that. But guess what? He's got to do it. So I'd go back and say, you've got to do it. Unless he can absolutely prove, and it's for him to do it, not you, that that Mm. machine is not faulty. Look, many people do say they won't do it because they just don't understand the new law. But the law is very clear now. That's what he's got to do. Mm. Um, Jackie, when you say it's slow, uh, yeah. I mean, you're talking about Facebook and online banking and so on. Um, could, it, could it be that it's your connection that is slow? Your internet well, is slow? Well, my um, old computer is just the same as yeah. the new one. Well, so yeah, but, that, but what I'm saying is... You know, whatever computer you've got, if you've got a slow internet connection, it's going to be slow. Yes, I get that. I understand that. But um, th- this, this is um, the actual I mean, machine. It's not. It's not. Um, it's not an up-to-date machine. It's not a new one. I've had someone who knows about computers. It's not a new machine. Look. No, 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 no. It's it's a new. It's a new PC. It should it should be better than my old 
PC. Mm. It depends why it's slow, really. If it's slow on the internet, then Clive may be right because it may be your internet connection. But they will check this if they're checking the computer properly. And the important point to note is that it's for them to do that, not you. Then they will check. And what they're checking is, is it the processor in the computer that's slow or is it literally your internet connection? Mm. If it's your connection, as Clive's saying, then that's your issue, not theirs. Okay. If it's the computer, then it's not. Good luck, Jackie. Thank you very much. Jermaine in Essex. Hello, Jermaine. Hello. Hello. What would you like to say? Well, I'm calling about a bed that I purchased last year, August. Yep. After a few months, it started to dip in the middle. It's an Ottoman bed, so it has um, it's one of those with storage in the middle. Right. Uh, it started to dip after a few months. Um, and I started to cause a few back problems for myself and my wife. Uh, so um, I went back to the uh, retailer and told them about the problem and told and showed them pictures, actually, and told them that this, you know, obviously it's not ideal. They told us that we had a two-year guarantee, you know, could we actually um, get a replacement or at least um, get someone to come in and look at it and sort it out. They um, said that they would, and they said that they sent us a replacement bed after looking at the pictures. After about two months, or well, the only thing they sent us was a bar, <laughs> Um, to cover the middle of the bed, which did nothing, it started to bend again. And so um, after some advice from the Citizens Advice Bureau, we dismantled the bed um, and told them that we dismantled it. Sent them a few emails, sent them a pictures again, just to remind them of the situation. Um, they also advised us to send us some letters that we, via recorded delivery. We did that, sent three different letters stating um, what we want, what the problems were, the pictures again. Um, those letters were totally ignored and they didn't send anything back to us. And I got confirmation that they had received it. Um, again, went back to the Citizens, and Citizens Advice Bureau. Um, they told us to go to the retail ombudsman. We went back to them. They chased up with the company. They didn't get any response, and this happened about twice. Um, so apparently the next step is um, what we've been told, to try the small claims port court. But we're wondering, is that worth pursuing? And are we going to be compensated for, um, I mean, the waste of time? It's been like since last year, August, we hadn't had any response um, nothing back to us at all. And I mean, we've had to dismantle the bed and basically sleep on the floor. Well, when a trader or a retailer fails to respond to the retail ombudsman, it's always a bad sign because it means they really don't care about your rights as a customer and are not interested in responding. Therefore, going to the small claims court may not help because, as you may have heard me speak to a caller earlier, you can you can win and maybe it'll be a hollow victory. You'll get no money from it. What I would do is this is a situation where trading standards can be really useful because if you're having this problem, you can be certain that other people have had the same problem. This is where trade your local trading standards officers will be useful because if they look at patterns and if they get more complaints about a trader, they go in and they do something about it. They can go knock on the door. So I would look at to do that. Um, Maybe the small claims court is worth threatening it, threaten it to see if they bite, to see if they're concerned about that. But it's a really difficult situation. How did you pay for this bed? Uh, we paid for it by uh, what debit card, uh, so straight over our account. Okay, so there's one avenue for you: debit or credit card. Debit card. Debit card. Okay, so there's something called the chargeback scheme. Go back to your bank where the debit card's mm -hmm. from explain the situation and tell them you want to make a claim under the chargeback scheme. They'll send you out some documentation for that and they may well reimburse you, then step in your shoes and take up the fight with the company for you. Worth a try, Jermaine. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, more calls coming in a moment for the Consumer Hour. Dean Dunham is here and if you've got a question, then uh, be quick. Call now 0345 6060 973 LBC. I'm Clive Bull. It's 9.45, the travel with Andy Lake. Thank you. Ian Collins here at 10 right now. It's the Consumer Hour. Dean Dunham is with me and we're answering your consumer questions. So let's go next to Andy in Shoreditch. Hello, Andy. Oh, hi, Clive. Hi, what's yeah. your question? Uh, well, I've had an extension bill at home and ordered some roof lights from quite a large company. Um, it cost about five grand. Oh. Um, you know, when they turned up, they all looked great and the builder put them in, so I didn't have them installed by the company, but they looked fantastic. But then when the sun shines through them, I noticed that there's cloudy marks all over them. So I paid extra to have this uh, special kind of glass self-cleaning glass put on and what it looks like is that it's not been put all over the glass this is what the builder reckons so i've been in touch with the company lots of emails back and forth 
They sent someone down after about five weeks. They agreed that there's nothing they can do. There's a problem. So I then wrote to the credit... Well, it wasn't a credit card. It was a Visa debit card. Wrote to them with all the bumps and told them. But since I've done that, the glazing company won't talk to me at all. So I just wondered, is there anything I should be worried about? When you say they won't talk to you, do they know you've gone to your debit card company? Well, I told them that I was within 120 days, so I had to do that right. because yep. once I'm outside that 120 days, then my insurance runs out. So I said to them, look, you know, I've got no alternative, but my 120 days runs out in four days, five days' time. I've got to let my credit card company know what's going on, um, but I'd rather resolve it between me and you um, if we can. But since yeah. then, as I say, I've not heard anything... I've left emails, left messages, and they just won't ring they, me back. They, won't. they are probably, they've probably gone quiet because you've gone to the debit card company. They may even have heard from them and are responding to your claim via them. So I wouldn't worry too much about it, although I would go back and get in writing and say you're disappointed you have not come back. And you will take it further if the debit card company doesn't pay out under the chargeback scheme, I would also ask them if they're a member of an ombudsman scheme or any sort of alternative dispute resolution scheme. They probably are, um, because most glazers are now. And if they are, you can make a complaint there as well. OK, good luck, Andy. Thank you very much. Annie in Kilburn. Hello, Annie. Hello, hi. Hi. I have a question to ask. Last November, me and my partner decided to take a family together to California for this August coming. We went through online and we bought a ticket from a, online from a company and they said we can pay in installment. The, the ticket for five of us will cost £1,000 each. They said if we pay, we pay 250 each, then we can reserve the ticket, make the re- remaining balance paid after January holiday. And we accepted we made the payment. But as we are originally from Iran, on January, law changed in the United States, and they said if anyone from Iran, uh, born in Iran, traveled to Iran within the last five years, they won't be able to enter the United States. So they declined our entry when we done the form on the website. We went, I went back to the company, and I said, look, they changed. They rejected our entry there. Can we have the money back? They said no. According to them, it is, these are un, unrefundable tickets. So they can't give us the money back. I left it there, but am I right? Do I have any way to get my money back? I mean, I'm really upset about the way they treated us. It wasn't our fault we changed. We didn't. We can't travel. So we had to give up. Mm. I hear this story all the time. And in fact, Clive, you may recall, we've had this same question many times before um, during this hour. And unfortunately, there will be terms and conditions from that agency that say exactly what they've told you, that they take no liability if you are refused a visa or it takes longer than it should take. Um, These are non-refundable tickets. I'm afraid to say there's nothing you can do about this. It's your responsibility to get that visa. It's really bad luck, isn't it? Really unlucky. It is. It's so unlucky. And I think people have to realise that before you part with your money for an airline ticket, be certain that your passport's going to arrive on time, there's no visa issues, because you can absolutely bet there will be exclusions from the people selling you the ticket that they won't give you the money back. And the fact that the law changed during that waiting period, I mean, that makes it all the worse, Annie, but uh, yeah, not much good news, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Thank you, David in Guildford. Hello, David. Yeah, hi, good evening. Evening. Uh, Clive and Dean. Um, back in... 2015, August time, I placed an order for about five or six different furniture pieces from uh, an online uh, furniture manufacturer. Um, They arrived in different batches. Uh, In February uh, of this year, the final piece arrived, and uh, I unboxed it, and it was defective. Um, It was a chair, uh, two of the buttons that should have been nicely sewn into the chair were loose, and I took a photograph of it, and the following morning I wrote to the manufacturer or the, the supplier and said, uh, the chair's defective, I need you to repair it uh, or replace it, please. Um, they don't have a phone number. Um, it's it's uh, an online hot chat uh, service. And since that time, I've persistently asked them uh, to do uh, what I feel is the right thing to do, repair it or replace it. And they consistently tell me that they're all they're going to offer is uh, a refund 
a percentage refund, about 35% of the purchase price, uh, to resolve it. Uh, and that isn't what I want because I purchased what I thought was a new chair and, and that's what I want. So um, it's very difficult to communicate with them. No phone number. Uh, it's online. I have written to them, called a delivery, uh, expressed my dissatisfaction. And um, I don't well, know. Do you want your really money back, do you? Next. Um, actually, I'd be happy to have the chair that, that I ordered that was as I wanted it. Um, right. But they're I saying don't... they can't repair it. I guess it's because maybe it's the manufacturer maybe he doesn't produce it anymore. But let me just ask you this. So they're offering you a percentage back. Are they saying that because it's only one chair? Because you said it was delivered in, p- in different pieces. Oh, no, sorry. There were separate items. There were six. Or six. It was about two and a half thousand pounds worth of furniture I ordered. Six right. or seven different pieces. All separate pieces. This one, all the others were okay. Not great, but okay. But this one's defective. You know, it looks dreadful. And... Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd be happy to get my money back if that was the only uh, path I could take. I'd be happy to get it repaired. Uh, I'd be happy to get it replaced. But, I but they're doing want... nothing. But all they want to do is offer me uh, a refund of a, a 35% of the value of the goods. Um, and can that's I, all can I just offering. check this, though? Is that 35% of the value of all the goods or just that one chair? No, the item is about £600 or so. But it's, but it's it's 35% not... of the one chair that they're offering you. Correct. Yeah. The well, well that's nonsense. They can't do that. I would go back to them and say, there's a few options. If you had the right... Was this chair bespoke or was it just kind of an off-the-shelf chair? No, no it's an off-the-shelf uh, replica of a, of a chair. Well, it's maybe go back and say, you purchased it online. Consumer contract regulations say you can reject it or give it back within 14 days of delivery. That's what you're doing, and I want my money back, please. You can go down that route if, if you want to do that, or just say it's faulty under the Consumer Rights Act. I want a repair or a full refund. They can't just say, I'll give you a percentage, um, unless you've actually used the goods, which you haven't. So they're in the wrong. OK, good luck, David. Thank you. A couple of quick questions on text here. Dave in Stoke Newington says, British Airways uh, described the seat I booked as a window seat, but on that flight, the last row had no windows. Can I claim? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think he's pushing his um, luck, isn't he? <laughs> no, I don't think he is pushing really? his luck at all. If he thought he was buying a window seat... <laughs> then he should be sat next to the captain or, ne- or next to a window. Therefore, no. I <laughs> think you should always get what it says on the tin. If you don't, yeah. you get your money back. But if there's a small print saying, we reserve the right to, to shift you, I mean, they, they, well, do, that's different. they do move you around, don't they, they on do. those planes? They do. Uh, that, that is different I like that idea, case. though. A window seat, but there's no window. And uh, let me quickly, uh, we've had a door expert text in as well. Going back to Abbas, you remember? Yeah. Uh, Gary, the door expert, says... Uh, Abbas doesn't need to remove the door. The problem is with the keep alignment. With the door open, pull the handle up and turn the key. If the door locks, then the problem is with the keep, and that's what he needs to adjust. So hope that helps, Abbas. Clive, isn't that the wonderful thing about this show? People call in, they give you answers like that that we just didn't know. Exactly. I certainly wouldn't have known that. Uh, Dean, thank you (laughs) very much. much. We'll see you next week, same time. Many thanks to uh, Dean Dunham.